All right. Well, let's let's get started. This is uh, this is Chem Two Hundred Three Organic Spectroscopy. Welcome and thank you, thank you all for turning on your videos. I want this so much to be as much as like a normal class as possible and being able to look out and get people's response and get people's interaction is is really really important to me so thank you thank you so much for doing that you know one of the things that obviously we don't have is the physical interaction the literally getting getting to know each other in space as first year graduate class as a department we'll get back to that and i think by the time you know by the time springtime rolls around summertime rolls around it's really time to get going and in lab things will i hope get back to normal but in the meantime this is what we've We've had many of you probably have already finished up your college courses on on Zoom, so you may be well more familiar with this than I am. One thing I'd like to do to get started, again, maybe to make up for the fact that there's no real physical interaction outside outside the classroom, is to take a moment to introduce ourselves. So I'm James Nowick. I've been on the faculty here since 1991. In spite of the whiteboard, which I'm going to be trying for, uh, for the course, uh, we're broadcasting from my, my living room here. Um, <laughs> you may occasionally hear my cat chiming in in the background or my husband uh, having breakfast, but uh, but basically we are we are trying as much as possible to be sort of in a in a virtual classroom here with this little studio I've set up. Um, who wants to go next? I'd love to hear from you and hear a little bit about about you. James, do you want to want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. I was going to say that might be useful for everyone. Hello, I am also James. You can call me James G or James Jr., whichever you prefer. I'm a third year student in James's lab. I'm studying a peptide antibiotic called Tyxobactin. If you'd like to learn about our research, I'd love to talk with you about it. This is my second time TAing the course and teaching is something that I'm passionate about. I'm trying to work on my career development for it. If I can be of any assistance to you during the course, I'd love to be able to make that happen. I think this is probably one of the most useful graduate courses you'll take as an organic chemistry student. It's a bummer that we can't do some of the hands-on stuff we would otherwise, but if all goes well, hopefully I'll be able to help with some of the hands-on NMR experience that you would otherwise get if you would be able to be trained in person. So looking forward to seeing everyone. We'd like to go next, just chime in, we'll all manage. I can go next. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Partho. Uh, I'm an incoming grad student in organic department. Uh, I did my undergrad uh, nearby here at UC Riverside, and I'm really excited to be here and learn about spectroscopy. I'll go next. Um, hi, my name is Philip. Um, I'm uh, first year on the organic track. Uh, I did my undergrad at Emory um, over in Atlanta. Um, and while I was there, I did research uh, with Professor Hugh Davies on uh, CH functionalization. I'll go next. Um, my name's Carissa Kenny, and I'm from Utah. And I graduated from Brigham Young University, um, which is also in um, Provo, Utah. And I'm excited to be here as well. Um, yeah, that's it. I can go next. Uh, hi, my name is Han. I am graduated from UC San Diego, and uh, I am very excited to learn about this class because this turned to be the most difficult thing for me, learning organic chemistry. So hopefully this class will help me uh, learn a lot about spectroscopy. Okay, uh, I'm Brian. I went to Ohio State. I'm from Ohio, and I work for David Nagib. I'm also an organic first year. Uh, I think I can go next. Uh, my name is Ming Hao Wang. I'm from China and I graduated from Nankai University. I'm also an 
organic track student. And I worked with Professor Newhouse at Yale University last year. And it's, it's a great pleasure to join you all for this class. Hi, uh, I'm Franco. Uh, I'm a first year in the organic track. I graduated from UW-Madison. Um, I did my undergraduate research with Professor Tesh Kuhn um, and ready to learn about some NMR and IR first, actually, because that's what you have to choose about, right? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am Chris. Um, I probably have a much more unorthodox background than most of you. I actually have a, a bachelor's degree in anthropology, but uh, found my way into chemistry with the for interesting avenues, let's say. Um, but super excited to be pursuing chemistry at Irvine. And I think I might be the only incoming first year in the, on the chem bio track, but I'm curious to know if there, anybody else is, is going to be going chem bio or if everyone is, is hardcore organic. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Tran. I'm actually a third year from Google's lab. And I'm here to kind of like refresh my knowledge on the basic skills. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm also in chem bio. I don't know if that helps. I'm a transfer over from the ph pharmacy, uh, pharmacy department. So I'm here. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna. Um, I'm a first year grad student. I'm also organic chemistry track and I came from San Diego and in my undergrad, I did natural product synthesis. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jordan Thompson. I'm a first year on the organic track and I went to Cal State Fullerton for my undergrad working on small molecule inhibitors for botulism. Hi, I'm Kirsten. I'm also a first year on the organic track and I went to University of Wisconsin in the fall. And I'm excited to be here. Hi, I'm Emily. I went to Harvey Mudd, first year organic track and I'm excited for spectroscopy. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm also a first year organic track. I went to Occidental College. Uh, just as excited as anyone else to be here. Hi everyone, um, 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 I'm, a, um, uh, I'm a senior, um, uh, finishing my like, undergraduate program here. Um, I'm working with Professor Weiss, um, doing a lot of like chem bio stuff and also um, like, um, um, and also like synthetic chemistry. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm taking this course uh, just so that um, when I go to like graduate school, uh, I can be um, like a lot more like, prepared. So yeah, um, uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to be here with, with everyone. Well, I think, did I miss anybody? Did we miss anybody? I think we are, that is all of us, 15 plus James and, and myself. And I think what I'm going to do to start is take a few minutes to go over the syllabus and then we'll start by talking about a little bit of an introduction and theory to IR spectroscopy and see how, how far we get. So I'm going to try to, to share my screen here and I think it'll be really useful if you're willing to uh, to shout out if the tech is letting us down. So can you see the syllabus nice and big? Yeah, it looks good. All right, all right. So this is my uh, personal meeting ID and that's just the easiest, uh, easiest way rather than having a special class uh, place, which also means if you pop in at the wrong time, I might be in other meetings, but that's, that's fine. Um, all right, so we have a website. It's on the Canvas uh, Learning Management Unit. I presume by this point you've all figured out how to log in, and I've put a convenient hyperlink here. So we're going to use a couple of textbooks for the course, and I always worry about cost, particularly, particularly this year when there's probably some extra copying costs that you might incur. And I'd like to think that what you're doing really is buying your library as professional organic chemists. So one of the uh, books that we're going to use is the Silverstein book. This book has been around forever. It gives a nice introduction 
to most of the topics we'll cover. The treatment of mass spec is a little bit old fashioned and so uh, there's a big focus on electron ionization, which is, just isn't as important anymore. And there's less of a good coverage of 2D NMR, but we'll be getting a lot from the lecture and supplementary readings. The other book, and by the way, if you can get your hands on the seventh edition or you've gotten your hands on an older edition, that's just fine. The sixth and seventh are virtually identical. Um, another book that I think is really useful for reference tables is this book by Pretch. And again, it's, oh, I, you know, well, I'm up small, but that's fine. It's, it's up on your screen here. And this book has also been through a bunch of editions. I happen to like the second edition, which I have here. I have the third, I have the fourth. They give them to me for teaching the course. But when I grab books to come home, I grab the second because it's familiar. Maybe somewhere I have the third, third edition here. So you'll notice from the email I sent out that for a spectroscopy course, it seems that we're doing something very odd by having uh, you know, computational chemistry and molecular modeling, but in order to really be able to appreciate some of the features of NMR spectroscopy, particularly NOEs, coupling constants, and stereochemistry, molecular models are super helpful. And you can use plastic models too, but we're also going to be using some basic molecular modeling skills and this is again going to be part of your toolbox. As I said when I sent out the email, my group license for PyMole also allows, it, allows me to distribute it to students. I think now we've actually got a site -like license for the department. That's a simple piece of software that's got some basic molecular modeling. We'll also do molecular mechanics and conformational searching with uh, with macro model and the maestro uh, user interface. Um, and so we'll be learning that a little bit along the way to complement our studies. Uh, three button mouse is really, really, really required for these. They really don't work, even if you've got a good keyboard and you can do shortcut keys. Pymole in particular, you're already using your keys. Um, I think most of you, in spite of the fact that everything's gone so electronic and I've got, you know, my iPad and my phone and everything else, I think most of you are still going to be most comfortable with some paper copies that you work on. I've seen people do it on electronic copies. If you're very good, um, maybe you can be as comfortable. I strongly recommend a real grown-up scientific ruler, not one of those wooden cruddy things you had in grade school. Um, and we will be finding a way to get you uh, grids or you can print laser print them onto uh, transparency film. James and I will work together to coordinate uh, how to get each of you one of these. We overlay these on 2D spectra. We won't be using them a lot until later on, although I made them up. They're actually even great for working on, on integrals. As I said, you almost certainly are going to, uh, going to want to print stuff out. If you have a cheap laser printer or inkjet printer, it's great. James and I are working on ways to get at least local people printouts as an alternative. Although again, I'd say, you know, it's really handy to have. Uh, you can contact James and we will coordinate on a case by case basis on how to get you printouts if you need them. Of course, we're gonna spend about a week on IR spectroscopy, about a week on mass spectrometry, and then we're going to start with what I call basic NMR spectroscopy, proton, 1D spectra, and carbon, and we're gonna get really, really good at understanding it. Um, then we're going to move on uh, after the midterm or in the second half of the course, to what I call advanced techniques, advanced 1D techniques and 2D uh, NMR techniques. So we're going to have weekly problem sets due Mondays. There may be, 
I think this year there are no holidays that require us shifting discussion section. So basically they're due at the end of discussion section. Discussion section is going to be on Mondays from 5 to 5.50. Please, 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 and I know for people who are remote, particularly China, I know that the lecture in the morning uh, makes it is challenging to attend. Please, please, please try to uh, attend the discussion sections in person if you can't attend the lectures uh, due, to, due to conflicts of hours. The, uh, there's two scheduled holidays in the class, Veterans Day on November 11th and the Thanksgiving holiday on uh, November 26th and 27th. So class, uh, class will be closed. I may still have an office hour on the 27th if people want, those are all optional. We're going <coughs> to have a midterm exam. It's pretty late in the course. It's November uh, 14th, a Saturday. There's a, it's all take home. There's a closed book part that's one hour, loosely defined, don't stress about timing, but it should be about an hour. And then an open book part and open-ended, uh, which probably means, you know, till the end of the weekend or something. But in the physical context, people, you know, can go have lunch and so forth and go out and just not talk about the exam together. And I'd expect that to be the same in the virtual course. Similar on the final, all the way late on December 19th after your class. And again, it's open-ended. The open book parts are open notes, open laptop computers. I've seen people watch the videos for the course during these things. I've seen people watch football games during these. That's all good. There are a few things you can't use. We'll talk more about those later. All right, grades. You know, I wanna say something about grades. You're gonna work really, really hard in this course. People just kill themselves with work. and. Honestly, graduate school isn't really about grades. You're gonna, you know, virtually everyone's gonna get an A, an A minus, a B plus, or a B, and it's, you know, not gonna matter, have a whole lot of consequence. In general, people aren't really going to care about. It. The most important thing you can do is try to learn as much as you can. The grades, and that's just because about being a graduate student really is about being excellent. It's about being at the absolute top of your game in your discipline. So you're going to work really, really hard. The, the homework sets by the end are insanely long. People, I think people respect them. They also know they work their, you know, work their tails off on this. The grades are something that I can, you know, a small token I can give you in recognition of your effort and how well you've done it, and take it in that context. For what it's worth, I'll count the midterm about 40%, the final about 45%, problem sets and participation and discussion about 15%. And as I said, don't, don't stress about it. Historically, grades that are sort of 90s, maybe you know, 92, 93 and above have been A's. Grades that have been you know, sort of 80s, 82 and above up into you know, maybe the lowest of the 90s have been A minuses. Historically, grades that have been you know, sort of low 70s, maybe, you know, 73, 72, somewhere around there, have been B pluses and grades that have been kind of low 60s on up have been Bs. Um, and, I, you know, I'm confident everyone can fall in that range if they engage with the course. Uh, and I suspect it's going to be a very similar sort of straight scale um, just because historically I really, really know performance in the course and I know what I expect. But again, it's, it's just a token. Um, all right. So 
James has already introduced himself. I'm going to hold sort of a combined office hour and study section. Historically, people have taken the space outside my office on Friday nights to work on the problems and I've come out and joined them. Or if people needed to talk about anything in person, we can go in my office. We can use a breakout room for that if people need to talk about something privately. Um, and then uh, kind of in the same feeling as those Friday, and again, the office hours and study section are optional and people work together. It's, it's really cool. People go to the, the whiteboard in the physical space. I'm assuming that either by use of a cell phone and piece of paper or use of your computer and annotation, kind of the way Professor Blum has, has mentioned to you, you'll be able to find ways to communicate both here and in the discussion sections. James is going to be hosting something we started uh, last year, which is the Sunday, Sunday evening, for want of a better term, jam session, study section, sessions before the homework um, is due on Monday. There'll be reading assignments. I created a page, separate page, and that will, um, update, but basically as we start a new chapter, there'll be reading assignments uh, to coincide with the first lecture. There'll be a few additional assignments and James and I will continue to update that. Homework assignments, um, just a, so much of the learning occurs in doing it. And this, the exam, the problems aren't gonna just be solving structures. And that's one of the shortcomings of a lot of NMR books. It's like, oh, What's this molecule? What's that molecule? Solve this structure, solve that structure. That's only part of the thinking that's involved. And I've crafted, and James has helped, we've crafted, and TAs over the years have helped for that matter, craft problems that have a variety of different thought skills that real practicing organic chemists use in their day-to-day -day life. And these are part of the homework problems. And so these are gonna be really the way a lot of learning occurs. We'll count them plus all the going to the whiteboard or whatever metaphorical whiteboard we have in discussion section um, as about 15% of the grade. After you can annotate your homework. Um, we'll figure out the mechanics of collecting. It. It's probably gonna be some sort of scans, although James and I may be willing to, uh, to figure out a way to drop off uh, you know, non-scanned copies as well. Um, you can annotate them. Honestly, I think the main thing, show your own thinking, do your own work, and then if you want to use a pen or pencil, something different to annotate them, that's okay. Um, you know, attendance is really, really important. Uh, I'm willing to work with anyone if they can't due to reasons of distance or schedule or internet, uh, and we will be recording all the lectures. And James, if you can make sure to remind me if you don't see a recording warning on the lectures, uh, you know, as I start, just remind me to hit the button, but I should be able to do that. And as I said, try to Try to engage and keep your camera on. Um, you know, I'm going to give some requirements on academic honesty. Basically, you know, don't use answer keys. You know, it's okay to work together. I think a lot of learning occurs cooperatively. It's not okay to say, okay, I'll take problem one, get the answer, give it to you. You take problem two, get the answer, give it to me, three, four, et cetera. That's, that's not learning. Um, you know, hopefully not, not too much bad stuff's gonna occur this quarter, but you know, work with me. We can, we can accommodate just about anything. It's a small group of 15 people and you know, accommodations can be made liberally upon request. So work with me or work with, with James on this. I have in the rest of the syllabus, a listing of topics here. Um, I'm not gonna spend any more time on them because I'd like to get going with the lecture. Maybe the one last thing that I will share with you is just very briefly, the anatomy of the website um, 
So we've got our home page here. Um, we've got the syllabus for the, the course, I guess, is the home page. You'll have assignments. I think what I'm gonna do is have both the reading assignments and homework assignments, and we'll just keep updating the reading assignment, probably just concatenate additional reading into the same one. We're gonna have various um, class materials links here, things that you might find useful, old lectures on video, um, some handouts, uh, and I'll be sending out new handouts, uh, UCI NMR manual, some other teaching materials that I've developed. Um, let's see. And I will put uh, a page that links to the lecture and discussion videos. So I think that's about it for the anatomy of the course. And I would love to take some questions before we dive in. All right, well, let us, let us get going. And I want to start by making really an impassioned plea for IR spectroscopy as probably the first technique that many people should be reaching for, particularly in synthetic organic chemistry. So much of synthetic organic chemistry involves transforming functional groups, adding a Grignard reagent to a ketone to get an alcohol, going ahead and forming a carbonyl group from, um, from a, you know, some other process, transforming an acid chloride into an ester. And all of these changes in functional groups get picked up so well by IR. It's just good at identifying functional groups. And I wanted to start out with a, a little story. Let me just change the tilt angle on the screen a little bit. I wanted to start out with a little story from my own graduate career of sort of how, just how powerful the mundane act of getting an IR spectrum can be. So in my third year or fourth year of graduate school, I was doing some chemistry with thiol esters. So here's an example of a thiol ester. A thiol ester is very much like a regular ester, except on the carbonyl group. Instead of having what was an alcohol, you have what was a thiol. So this is the acetyl ester of benzene thiol. And I was trying to carry out some aldol chemistry on the thiol ester. Thiol esters, I should point out, are very much like other carbonyl compounds. The IR stretch for a thiol ester is typically about 1700 uh, wave numbers, 1710 wave numbers. And so I was trying to do some aldol chemistry. So I treated my thiol ester with LDA in THF. And then I added a carbonyl compound. I was using cyclohexanone at the time. Cyclohexanone being a ketone. And finally, I did an aqueous workup. And I went and literally you know, did what I said, which is IR maybe after a TLC of the reaction, which generated a, a single new spot on the TLC. IR is probably the first tool you should be reaching for. And I got a product 
with a strong band at 1820 wave numbers. Eighteen twenty wave numbers is a really unusual position in the IR spectrum. It's still in the carbonyl region, but most carbonyl compounds don't don't come there. Most carbonyl compounds come, you know, seventeen high sixteens for amides, sixteen fifty, sixteen ninety, something to that effect, through maybe seventeen fifty for esters. A few things come above above eighteen hundred. But the hypothesized product would have been the aldol product, where the enolate added to the carbonyl compound. And after aqueous workup, we got an alcohol. Well, there sure as heck was no alcohol band. Then we still would have had a thiol ester, which would have been about 1710 wave numbers. And I knew that. This type of range is characteristic of small strained ring carbonyls. And so with just a little bit of mechanistic thinking, I realized, oh shoot, I generated a beta-lactone. That's really, really cool. Beta-lactones are hard to make. They're important. They're present in a variety of natural products. And this plus a subsequent reaction of, of beta-lactones became the remainder of my dissertation and a patent. So a, a paper, a JOC paper, an org sin prep, and a patent by this serendipitous discovery here. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. If you're forming bonds, this is the reaction that you should be going for. Uh, this is the tool that you should be grabbing for first. Because honestly, the NMR spectrum would not have told me that I had a four-membered ring or this very special carbonyl group. And it just screamed, just sang out of the IR. And I'll also point out, get your analyses on crude reaction mixtures, get your analysis, you know, quick proton NMR, quick IR spectrum, you will learn so much. Organic chemistry is so often not about synthesizing the desired product, in which case you're only focusing on what the product is. It's on understanding byproducts and side products because ultimately, even if you want to get the desired product, you want to get it in good yield. And understanding and thinking about everything that's happened in your flask, all the other products that have been generated, the mechanistic pathways by which they've been generated really is critical to effectively running reactions. Now, this is not going to be a course in mathematics, I am very much a roll up your sleeves and do it kind of person. So when I talk about theory, I'm talking sort of about the practical aspects of what I mean by theory. And the basic idea is that you're getting transitions between quantized vibrational states. In other words, you're exciting a vibration from the ground state to the first excited state with infer, infrared light. Most of the, the transitions that you're dealing with, most of the vibrations that you're going to be dealing with that occur in the useful region are stretching vibrations And to a first order approximation, you could think of this just as a bond literally stretching. In other words, let's say a CH bond getting longer and shorter and vibrating as two, two groups together 
Um, and that's a good approximation uh, for what's happening. And basically in a quantum oscillator, the ground state has a zero point vibration. You'll excite it to essentially, you could think of it as the first harmonic. Now, in reality, particularly vibrations involving hydrogens, but also we're gonna see vibrations involving carbon yield groups and vibrations involving nitro groups often are coupled, meaning it's not just one atom and another atom, but multiple atoms working in conjunction. And so if we start with something very simple, like a methylene group, what we're dealing with are not one type of vibration twice, not just the CH stretches, but the CH stretches couple into two different energy levels. They couple into a symmetric stretch. And an asymmetric stretch. The symmetric stretch would just be, if my body is the carbon, would just be a motion like this, whereas the asymmetric stretch would be a motion like that. Those two vibrations couple, and so you end up with two different vibrational frequencies. So if you look at a simple compound like an alkane or mineral oil that's sometimes used to suspend IR samples, you'll see in the CH stretching region, two distinct bands, one for the symmetric stretch at about 2850 wave numbers, the other for the asymmetric stretch at about 29.25 wave numbers. And we're gonna see implications of this again when we deal with carbonyl compounds like anhydrides. I thought uh, symmetric stretches were IR inactive. Ah, very good question. So the question is, are symmetric stretches IR inactive? And the answer is that what's key here is you have to have a net change in dipole moment. And this is gonna be critical. So the IR, the infrared light, the photon, interacts with the bond dipole. And you have to have a net excitation that involves a change in dipole moment. So a classical example would be carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, of course, is a linear molecule. You've got big bond dipoles. You've got sort of a delta positive on the carbon and delta negatives on the oxygen. So nice big fat bond dipoles. And there's two mo modes, the symmetric stretch and that is at 1340 wave numbers, but the symmetric stretch, and again, I'll do that silly bit with my, my hands and my body, the symmetric stretch involves changes in each of the bond dipoles, but not changes in the molecular dipole. So it is inactive no net change in dipole moment. But the asymmetric stretch, which occurs at a higher frequency, at higher wave numbers, occurs, is seen, And that occurs at about 2350 wave numbers. And if you go ahead and you have an IR spectrometer, 
and you literally breathe on it, maybe now with a mask it won't occur, but you literally breathe into it just as you're putting your sample in there, you will see bands for the carbon dioxide and specifically you'll see the symmetric stretch. Now, we're not gonna focus much on gas phase and small molecules. In fact, we're not gonna focus on them at all, but for CO2, and for that matter, for water vapor, where you will also see, because O of HOH also has symmetric and asymmetric stretches, you'll see fine structure to those bands associated with the rotational transitions that largely become irrelevant for big molecules and condensed phase, either liquid or solid phase IR. But if you look at an IR spectrum, and I think I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waste time by projecting it here because I wasn't intending to, but I'm gonna hold this up here actually. So this is an example of an IR spectrum and here's our CO2 because I breathed into the spectrometer. Here's our water vapor. Uh, asymmetric stretch because, again, I breathed into the spectrometer. And for that matter, as long as I have this silly thing up here, we have here the, uh, this is just mineral oil. So mineral oil, new Joel, is often used to suspend solid samples for IR spectroscopy. And we see in the IR spectrum, there's nothing other than CH stretches, and you'll see the asymmetric stretch and the symmetric stretch at the numbers I said of about 29, 25, and 25, 20. Now that brings us, as long as I'm projecting this silly thing up here, this brings us to these other two bands here. And I wanna take a moment to talk about bending vibrations. So the stretching vibrations tend to be at higher energy higher frequency, and that's important because for most big organic molecules below about 1600 wave numbers, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of bending vibrations, a lot of other things, and it's very hard with big molecules to find diagnostic peaks. For a small ester, you can probably pick out the CO single bond stretch, which is down somewhere in the 1300-ish range. For some others, you may be able to pick it out, but for the most part, we're gonna be focusing on the region above 1600. But at least I want to mention bending vibrations. And I think what I want to do is just in that same context, those bands that I pointed to, to here. So just as the CH bonds can stretch, the CH bonds can bend back and forth. And you could almost think of this like, you know, coming closer together and coming further apart and oscillating. Lower, it takes lower energy to excite that and again, for a methylene group, there's a couple of modes. There's an in-plane bending. And that in-plane bending occurs at about 1465 wave numbers. And then there's an out-of-plane bending. And that's usually lower. Maybe, maybe about 1380 for mineral oil for, car, for a simple, simple uh, hydrocarbon. You're probably not going to use that as diagnostic of anything. Now, the one exception that maybe I'll point out is if anybody is in the inorganic track or you're just looking at inorganic or organometallic compounds, Sometimes you have to go below 1600 and really scrutinize it for things like a, a metal halogen bond. But for most organic molecules, things get reasonably, reasonably crowded. So I want to 
come back. Was it Paul? Was it you who raised the issue of the the symmetric uh, stretch being inactive and sort of got me off on CO two? Yeah, uh, yeah, Partho, by the way. Partho, I'm sorry. So, you know, if it were just carbon dioxide, I'd say, all right, that's not really, really important to worry about. But there are things where there's not much dipole moment, bonds where there's not much dipole moment to begin with, and so there's no net change in dipole moment. So if we take an internal alkyne, and I'll take two pentyne, CH3, CH2, carbon triple bond, carbon methyl group. Now that bond isn't exactly symmetrical, but the bond dipole is pretty darn small. I mean, it's essentially nil, it's essentially nothing. So in this case, the carbon-carbon stretch really isn't seen. Now, why is this important to keep in mind? Well, I've just talked about how important IR spectroscopy is for identifying functional groups. But if you're expecting something wrongly, you're gonna be in trouble. If you say, oh, my molecule can't be an alkyne because I don't see a band at you know 2100 or thereabouts, you're gonna be in trouble. Here. So you have to get calibrated. The other thing about IR spectroscopy is it really is reading the spectra. You know, so when I hold up something like this and I say, oh yeah, just ignore that. That's a little water vapor in your spectrum. Being able to say, or oh, I did this in a KBR pellet. KBR tends to pick up water. There's a little bit of an O8 stretch, but I don't think it's really an alcohol. It doesn't look like a big strong alcohol band. This is the real judgment calls. And so looking at this region at say 2100 is important. Now, if we have, and again, I wanna give you context, I'll give you a different alkyne, I'll give you one butyne, then you're gonna see the CC stretch. It's gonna be at about 2120 wave numbers. And the main thing is here, that you do have, you know, essentially here you have essentially no net bond dipole, hence no change in mo dipole moment. Here you have a bond dipole. In other words, the electronegativity, the ability of hydrogen to donate electrons or withdraw electrons is different from uh, a methylene group. And if I had to describe this stretch, I would describe it as moderate in intensity. Now, one of the problems is spec books and books like Silverstein love to have simple small molecules. But you may be working with a molecule not with four carbon atoms, but with 40 carbon atoms or 20 carbon atoms. The fraction of that sample that your bond is occupying is going to be way, way lower. And so what may be moderate in a four carbon compound may be weak compared to all of the other signals in a 40 compact carbon compound. So there is context. And maybe just to finish, finish things up here, because I don't want to keep us too, too long. Let's just take an example where now we really do have a very polarized bond. Your oxygen is pumping electron density into the alkyne. That means you've actually got a big delta negative on the internal carbon and a delta positive on the external carbon. Now we're going to see a CC stretch, but it's going to be strong in intensity. So these are some of the types of flavors of things. And we'll start looking at real spectra next time. But these are some of the flavors of things that you're going to be dealing with and sort of learning to read.
And I'm going to be talking a lot about reading your spectrum because it really is going ahead and looking at the spectrum and try whether IR or NMR and trying to understand what's going on. So I think that about runs out of our formal time, but if there are any questions, let me take a moment to take them at this point. Uh, hi, so about uh, the symmetric stretching and stuff again. Um, is water an example where we would have a symmetric stretch that would um, show up on IR? Yeah, oh yeah. Water, first of all, carbon dioxide was a special case because it's a linear molecule. Water is a bent molecule. So whether your stretch is symmetric or asymmetric, there's a net change in, in dipole moment for the molecule. So for your water, you know, your, your, oops, what am I doing here? For your water, you go ahead and you've got a net molecular dipole that looks like that. So whether those bonds are getting shorter and, and longer in a symmetric sense or an asymmetric sense, your bond dipole, your, your dipole moment for the molecule is changing. Um, I have a question. So do we, considering the dipole moment using the electronegativity of the atoms? Yeah, that's a good way to go. And there's enough of a difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen that you do end up having a small a small effect. There's a few tenths of a unit difference in electronegativity. So basically, carbon-hydrogen bonds, carbon-oxygen bonds themselves have a dipole. Carbon-carbon bonds do not themselves. And if you have a symmetrical molecule, then you have to keep in mind the symmetry. Carbon-nitrogen, the same thing basically almost any bond between dissimilar elements. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. If you're looking at a methylene, but it's like, this is CH2, right? But at, at one end of the CH2, there are, it's different than the other end. Would you see a dipole moment? You kind of get what I'm talking about? One end of the CH2, is when you were showing us CH2 earlier, that's what I was... All right, so we have our CH2 group. And by one end, you mean here versus here? No, the, 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 the other ends, not the H's, but the oh. other... Yeah, like those, yeah. So like if those are different, right? But they're not different immediately, but maybe later down the chain. Uh, you mean like if I had an oxygen over here? Well, like carbon, but like later down the chain, there are oxygens, but much, yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I'm thinking about this, of course, the hydrogens are going in and out, so they're actually seeing this carbon in the same way, right? Because the carbon is tetrahedral, so one's out and one in. So I don't know that it's going to have that big an effect on a change in dipole moment. Maybe something subtle. Okay, sure. thank you. All right, well, we've already run a little bit over and I should probably let you get going. Uh, so I will see you on Monday. Thank you so much and welcome. And I guess we'll see each other twice on Monday. I think I will have my open office hours today if people want to drop by. I'm not going to stay five to seven, but maybe I'll pop in at five o'clock five to six and just keep the channel open if people want to drop by. Feel free to come by and introduce yourself or just chit chat. We'll, we'll talk for an hour. Um, yeah. I also have a question. It's because I have conflict with the schedule. I have the CHEM 290 seminar from four to 550, which interferes with your uh, discussion session, I think. Oh, the CHEM 290, that's sort yeah. of seminar. Just, uh -huh. just 
just on Wednesdays. In order that we were able to keep the room, we scheduled it three days a week. Okay. But not on Mondays. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. All right, you're very welcome.